Hi, everybody. How's it going? I'm in Redmond, Oregon, which is about the central part of the state. And the reason I'm there is because I'm right now I'm living in a 25 foot RV that February 4th, we left St. Petersburg and headed west along interstates 10 and 40 until we hit the deserts in Arizona, stopping at every national park on the way and a few other places. Uh, then we headed up the eastern side of the Sierra Nevadas and then up into Oregon. And shortly, we will be turning east again, going through Idaho, Yellowstone, South Dakota, North Dakota. So that's where we're at. Let me clarify, she's not a gypsy. This is, <laughs> she normally resides here in Florida. And she was Florida Watercolor Society's uh, 2021 president. That's where I got to know her. It's the first time I got involved with the Florida Watercolor Society. And I tell you what, uh, Terry, you know how to put on a show. I was a, a, a That was 2020. Um, oh, time flies, I guess. 20. Yeah. Wow. The first virtual. That and yeah, and you had to do a quick turnaround and turn it all virtual. So I got to help uh, Terry do a lot of uh, converting live to virtual. Uh, let me admit, admit some more people. And uh, Terry, I thought what we'd do is we'd start off and we'll show a video, uh, I think that was produced last year for the Florida Watercolor Society. And what I've done is taken a five minute clip. And uh, as you all have questions, uh, please uh, type them into the chat area. Uh, just a reminder, we're not gonna be talking about the meaning of life. Uh, or marital advice or stuff like that, Helen, okay? I'm going to go through the painting process from design stage to cleanup, and along the way, I'm going to show you a number of different tips, techniques, and hacks. Things that'll save Oops. you time, maybe save you some money. All right, let's start at the very beginning, shall we? Get yourself a ruler that has both centimeters and inches on it, because what we're going to do is that. design or draw a little square that is exactly the same proportions as the painting you want to do. For example, suppose you're going to do it on a piece of 16 by 20 block or a 16 by 20 aqua board. We're going through it the front way here. You can't draw a 16 by 20 and come up with the right, you know, that's pretty big. You want to do a thumbnail of it. So what you could do is exactly proportional. Instead of 16 inches, you can pick 16 centimeters. Now, if you look at this, 16 centimeters is pretty big. And 20 is going to be even bigger. That's awfully big for a thumbnail. Suppose you went just one half of that. That would be 8 by 10. And you just use the centimeter ruler and you draw a rectangle 8 by 10. And if that's still a little too big, half it again. Here you have one that's exactly proportional to a 16 by 20. A little too big, which it probably is. Let's go in half again. Four by five. And that looks like a pretty good thumbnail size, doesn't it? Now, suppose you're sitting there and you've done your sketch. Uh, and you started out with something about this size. And you've done your little sketch. And you have a birdie up here and a tree here. And it's sitting in it. And you decide that you need to crop that down. Well, crop it the way you think you need to, and then you can come back and measure it. Oh, well, that's four by five. And you had started drawing it, say, on a bigger piece of paper. Saves you accuracy. You come up with exactly the right proportions uh, for your thumbnail sketches. Okay, let's move on to the second thing. We're going to do some looking at a computer screen here in a minute, but how many of you have signed up for a workshop? 
you've gotten the materials list from the artist, and there are some colors on there you've never heard of or you don't have. Let's just suppose that you have gotten the workshop spec sheet or materials list, and the artist would like you to bring a tube of Mamer Blue Cupric Green D, a color you don't have and that you're not familiar with. Well, the easiest way to find out is if you do have it, is to go to one of the URLs for one of the online art supply stores. They'll all have similar information. This one happens to be Cheap Joe's. Go to the Memory Blue Cooper Green Deep page, scroll down on it, and you will see a section that's called More Information. Click on that section and you'll see on it a line that says pigment and gives you a, a number letter combination. You can see here that the pigment information for Cooper Green Deep is PG7. Well, that doesn't tell you a whole lot, but we can go to one more website and find out what PG7 is. All right, now let's find out what PG7 is. Let's go to a website called artiscreation.com. And on here, you'll see something called the art, the color of art site maps. We're interested in pigments, paints, and formulas. And pigments are what the type of paint coloring that we use. Um, and you'll see across the top a number, all the different colors that are represented. Now you can go straight to green and skip all the food or all, or you can click on the highlighted formula and it will show you the entire database, the color of art pigment database. By the way, this is the page that might be best for you to bookmark and you can skip the front pages in this particular website. You'll see, if you scroll down through this, you'll see all the different pigment numbers represented in each of the color families. Uh, you can click it, you can scroll down there and click on the number you want, or you can go up here to the top and click on the color group. Now this is, uh, which is what I just did here, and these are all of the green pigments. Across the top, you'll see what green pigments are identified here, and I've highlighted PG7. Well, that was fun, and uh, I, you can see why I liked it. Uh, a number of people in my classes, uh, Terry, uh, the topic of figuring out what pigment they actually have and corresponding it with other pigments and other manufacturers. Uh, this is coming pretty handy. Uh, th any comments you want to make? Uh, you got it unmuted, I'm sorry. Uh, still not on. Okay. Um, this some of them, the, say, for example, the, the thalo greens might be slightly different in each of the manufacturers because of the way they cooked it or a number of other things. But it should be pretty close and you may be able to adjust it. Uh, but if you can't find Cooper Green Deep, which I've never seen, thalo green is probably really, really close. And look to see if the blue shade or the or the you know the yellow shade, obviously. Cool. Uh, anybody have any questions about uh, the the site, the website, or any questions about finding colors? Mm -hmm. Can you repeat the name of the website? Ooh. Ron, can you pop that? Is there any chance you can see it? Okay, I think it's for the love of color or something like that. Is that there? You have it. Hold on a second. Let me uh, unhighlight you here. 
Um, there we go. Is it? What do you? What's it say right along the top oh, there? Yeah, the, skip the front pages in this particular website. You'll right. see if you right. scroll down through this, you'll see all. Can you see it? You can also just Google in color of art pigment database or something like that, and you'll find the website. Okay. Might be I have it actually in my uh, bookmarked up in the, the bar at the top, so I just click on it that way. Okay. Any other uh, questions? We're going to move on to another video. The other one has some really interesting hacks and uh, ideas. Okay, here we go. Get ready. Well, I think I'm ready. Hold on. Wait, somebody asked a question. Hold on. I think two of them. Yeah, let's go ahead and answer those. Uh, can you read them? Okay. Oh, okay. Lynn put the, uh, very good. Thanks, Lynn. She put the site on the chat room, put that on there. Ah, thank you. So that's handy. Art is creation. So there we go. There's the power of the artists coming together right there. All right. So let me get the other video up and we'll start it. Something else you might want to put together is a toolbox. Yes, a toolbox for artists. This box also costs one dollar. You can get it when school supplies go on sale. They're usually 97 cents for this one at Walmart. I have a number of them. I store, actually store paints in them. This is my box for blues and violets. I have one for reds and greens, one's for browns and yellows, uh, a few whites thrown in. This is a, just a general toolbox. You can also find these at Michael most times of the year, and for some reason they're on sale for a dollar frequently. Then the rest of the time there's some outrageous price. But why do you need a toolbox? Well, there's lots of loose stuff I hope you take with you. One way to get tight paint lids off. This is a nutmeg grater. We'll go into that shortly, explain why you need it. This, a small pair of needle nose pliers, is so that you can squeeze out the very last bit of paint uh, in a tube. And when you get down here to the end, you can fold it back over and really squeeze it out. So that's. A money saver. Of course, a couple of tube, uh, tube paint rollers. Now, here's something worth its money. This is a spare lid for every type and size of paint I have. Why do I have it? Well, there was a while there when my favorite brand of paint, represented by these little black lids here, uh, the lids kept breaking right around the rim. And whenever I had a supply that was no problem, um, I could take care of it. Let me see. I have in here a screwdriver, obviously. Any other, a little pocket knife. It doesn't need to be anything fancy. If it's sharp, you can use it to cut open tubes of hardened up paint because usually that plug is up near the top and if you do a slice in it a t slice you can dig out the paint that hasn't hardened up of course scissors anything else that you might want to put in it this is a uh, a line drawer and then something i'd like to demonstrate all right i have several of these and they were given to me by banks. This one is from an investment company I used to be with years ago. They're letter openers. If you can find one, they're usually free. They're a handy thing to have because they're a great way to cut paper. 
fold the paper. This is 300 pound right where you want to cut it. Put it in here, get it started. And then just pull. Recycling paper there. The little curve up on the end is easily ironed out. How many of you iron your paintings? I do. If you iron on the back side of a paper with a, the back side of your painting face down on your ironing board, Steam setting on cotton, which after all the paper is made out of, it does a beautiful job of ironing out any warps in it. That's especially, you know, a problem if you're using 140 pound paper instead of 300. Mm -hmm. Yep, there's my favorite tool right here. Thank you for sharing that with me. Um, this needle nose works great. Uh, and she mentioned that have you, I do, you ever have a problem getting that last little drop out of there? You can squeeze up the very end. Uh, you can see a little paint get on here. So that was a good tip. Anybody have any questions? You want to add anything to that, Terry? Well, not right now. Uh, what I did learn is a lot. Of, I didn't make these up. I either saw somebody else talk about them or some of my students did or some of them I just stumbled into by accident. So I can't claim credit for all of these tips. Um, some of them, but they came from other people as well. Could you uh, talk a little bit about, uh, this is fascinating, uh, what it's like to paint outside? particularly in some of the areas you've been lately? Uh, before this show started, I was telling Ron the uh, adventures that I had learning to paint in the desert in a high wind. Um, don't do it. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I'm kind of cramped for space here, but the design floor plan that we deliberately picked on this RV is a rear lounge one. So there are two separate work areas. My husband has a way of sprawling all over the table and taking up all the room available. And that was a sore point in the last RV we had. And it was on the boat that we lived on for 15 years. So this time I have a rear one that is a nice little couch back there. And I have a small collapsible table I can sit up in there. It's pretty small, though. It's only about 18 by 2 feet. And I can paint small things back in there. I do have it set up so that I can go outside and paint. We have another folding table that's uh, 18 by 4 feet. And I thought I would parade outside there. Um, uh, later on, I'll show you the, the setup I have for storing things. Uh, that's very compact, but I have a an easel that I've that has a breakaway top, a quick release top on it, and I have taken a an a canvas holder that was designed to fit in that type, and I have hooked it on there, and that can be used to hold either watercolor blocks or any kind of a solid block. Get that. Uh, I paint on panels a lot, as you know, aqua board, but you can also get panels with paper on them or you can get them with canvas or whatever. And you can clip it in that. So I grew up in the desert, but I'd forgotten how windy it could be. And things that they have called high wind alerts. But if you go outside and you paint outside anywhere, uh, watercolor, oils or whatever, if you set up your easel, take along a plastic grocery sack and hook it to the bottom of the easel. Most easels have a little hook you can hook in. If you don't get a carbon air or a wire tie or something, fasten that paper bag to the bottom very securely. Then go find a big rock and put the big rock in the, paper, in the, in the plastic bag. It'll keep it from blowing over. I also learned that it would be real smart 
if you can set it up so that the edge of your painting is into the wind, not a flat surface, because it'll blow right over. And then you wind up with what I did on the first oil painting I tried to do. Um, it has a bunch of little bug legs in it, a few scraps and pieces of sagebrush, a lot of grit and some tiny pieces of gravel. Is this your Very way of, organic painting. Is this your way of making organic uh, paintings? I think so. This one also is some, somewhat inorganic from the dirt. Uh, that's very interesting. Uh, at least you have your hand up. Well, unmute yourself. Oh, um, my question has to do with when you're talking about ironing your paper. You're working on a 140 pound paper. Do you dampen the paper first? The no, I, I iron both. I can iron one thir uh, 300 pound as well because sometimes it curls up. No, uh -huh. not at all. I use a steam iron. It's I've never had once it's totally dry, put it face down. I've never had any paint transfer. I use mm -hmm. a steam iron on cotton setting because it is cotton, cotton paper okay. on the back side and use the steam iron and it usually does a pretty good job of flattening it. Okay. And probably only for what, a minute or so, because otherwise it would burn the paper, wouldn't it? Well, it just like it would burn material yes you yeah. just uh, just you're just basically ironing it um mm -hmm. may, if it's really curled you might steam it a little bit more but it's i've never had any problems with it for years good idea thanks for sharing that one i'll pass that on to some of my students too any other questions or insights uh you're welcome to share yours too if you want anybody has something to share Not all at once now. Just one I have time. something I discovered in painting wet on wet. I'd like to share. <clears throat> and it's messy and I don't like mess. And so what I did is the paper is small enough. I can put it in a big sheet pan. And that way it keeps the water. Somebody also tried to use a pizza box. They used a pizza box to keep it in there used so, one. yeah Ooh. well that i'm sure they cleaned it or put something over it but the pan works really really well it looks well it would. It works well also to soak the paper if you want to soak it for a while because sometimes i have trouble getting it wet enough but i i just discovered that idea recently that's a that's a great idea well, I'm going to watch these shows. If anybody has uh, like uh, ironing burns on their paintings or pizza sauce on their paintings. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. That's cool. Anybody else? And uh, Terry's got a few more tricks up she'd like to talk about, but I'd like to hear from the rest of you. Any of, any of you have some tips, tricks, and techniques that are uh, shareable? Now, I know uh, Helen has five. Just take one at a time, Helen. Hmm. I pick on Helen because she's in my class. So. Oh, okay. She deserves it. Uh, share a few more uh, uh, tips and techniques that you've used in the past, Terry. Oh, okay. Um, how do you mark your brushes so that if you're at a workshop or something, and you're sitting next to someone, if they get mixed up, you, you tell yours from someone else. Um, I learned this from one of my students. I dipped the tips of my brushes in a very distinctive nail polish color. I used to wrap a piece of blue tape around them. And then one workshop I went to, there were three or four people who did the same thing. But I know there are other tips or ways to do it. Does anybody have their own unique way of marking their brushes? This is a silent crowd. Oh, no. Terry, I have I have been marking my brushes that way since I watched your dem demo. It's very helpful. <laughs> hmm. What color? What color of polish are you using? It's 
It's a bright, bright red. Ah, that's and it looks like it's a transparent red, too. Well, it's just because it's on gold, but and it's oh, normally okay. what I have on my toenails. <laughs> <laughs> that way it's easy to prove it's your right. price. Right. Okay. You have a matching purse? <laughs> I use my name that's on address labels. I have hundreds of address labels that have oh, been free. Yeah. And so I just take the name, nothing else, just the name and paste that onto the brush. Oh, that's I, a good idea. We get those all the time in the mail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you just cut out the name or the whole label? Just the name. Oh, cool. I like that. Uh, Terry, uh, tell us again. I just have to know because I forget. What was the grater for? The small little nut grater? Oh. No, there was a nut grater. The nutmeg grater? Well, nutmeg. Or any kind of grater like that. That one happens to be like a 25 cent one. Watercolor crayons, the kind that come in the box. There's two common brands, you know, the little metal boxes like this. If you wet a section of a paper, say one specific shape, might be a little bit boring. It's just solid color. You can take this nutmeg grater and grate one of those crayons over top of the wet section. It spreads out a little, not very much. It still stays like a nice, distinct little spot. If you want it to blur out a little bit more, you can just take and touch it. Just surface tension to surface tension, a bit of water off your brush. Now, when it dries, go blow it in any place the grated crayon fell that was dry, it just falls off or blows off but it's a way to give it's a texturing technique is all it is uh use a larger if you've got one of those that's small enough that has several sizes you can experiment with that uh instead of the real fine size and you have to you use uh watercolor uh crayons made out of watercolor pigment right yeah, there are water. They're not the real soft type that, cut, like Daniel Smith has, uh, the pigment in the sticks. They're actually firmer, but they are just watercolor uh, crayons. They're not wax or anything. They're, I'm not sure how they harden up, uh, but Darch makes one. There's at least two brands out there I know about. That sounds like a lot of fun. I always look for uh, see, texture. lots of ways of getting texture. Besides salt, you know, and all that. Yeah. And you can combine colors that way, too. Put several colors in one area. Oh, that's so cool. And uh, some of the uh, other ideas that you had, particularly on... Um, one thing that came to mind, I did not realize till that demo you did was maybe reinforce this, is the quality of uh, the difference between... Uh, student grade paint and uh, I guess professional or higher level. Uh, could you say a couple things about that? Well, what I did was demonstrate, I believe it was alizarin and crimson, and I used a student grade paint. Uh, one of the cheap paints that you can you can buy. It's actually made by a, a good company. Uh, and I can't remember the brand right offhand, but it's a real common one that you could buy in the small tubes. Um, and I painted out some of it, and then I took it, it basically close to full strength, uh, and then watered it down. And then I did the same thing with some alizarin crimson from Daniel Smith. And you see them side by side, one's pink and the other's a deep red. And it's just a matter of how much pigment is in each one of those paints. Good way to determine the quality of a paint. Uh, just paint it out like that, starting with a mass strength, you know, right out of the tube and watering it down. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, is there any new, um, first off, I've never used the aqua board. And uh, I think it's um, kind of like a Yupo. Uh, not at all it it's got a, it has a texture to it a very fine one that almost looks like suede if you paint 
a granulating paint on it. Uh, I actually, I have a piece here. I wasn't planning on you asking this, but I can show you. It's a thin layer of textured kaolin clay put over a masonite board. No, I take it back. Neither one of these is, these are canvas boards. Um, it doesn't, it paints its own style. It does, you have to paint it flat because it will run all over, run off if you do it elevated. But it's not slick like Yupo. Um, you have to kind of float it on at first. And the paint sucks into this very, this very thin layer of white kale and clay. But after that, it builds up on top of it. Um, I, it's hard to describe it. It is not slick like Yupo or Terra Skin. It does have a texture to it, but it's very different from painting on water. It doesn't soak in. So you can lift back to white using a short, you know, stiff brush or little kid's paintbrush or something like that. Um, it does pre it does texture where Yupo won't. Mm -hmm. But the texture is different from paper because it's a much finer texture. But it's permanent. You don't you spray it when you're finished with acrylic or with an acrylic varnish or something. And then you don't need any glass or any matting on. You don't need matting. You don't need glass. You can frame it up just like you would a, a an oil or an acrylic. Or you can, there are specific types of mats you can use for things like oil paints that'll work too, to make it even fancier. But it's always stock sizes, standard sizes, just like canvases are. So you can go out and buy a stock frame to fit it. Find the sale at Michael's or take one of those Sunday paper coupons if they still have them. But it's actually kind of fun. Uh, it's a different way of painting and it gives some, but it, it's, it works. And quite a few of the paintings you showed up front of, of from my website were done on aqua board. Oh, how can I tell the difference between uh, one with aqua board and one not? Is there something to look for that is different? Well, you probably would have to get close. Those photos wouldn't show the difference. It would be, first off, it's probably not going to have any glass on it. Um, but the texture will be very fine, almost like a piece of suede. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm going to give it a try then. Anybody else? And it's, try, yeah. The aqua board and were successful at it or unsuccessful? Uh, you can tell war stories, too. <laughs> I had a very unsuccessful experience with it. Oh, what happened? For, first time? First time. Um, yeah, my, my first one, I, I put it under the faucet and washed it off. <laughs> well, <laughs> mine, mine got too, I was in a pouring class, and it got too wet, and it buckled. Wow. It buckled, and it was just awful. It was if when it dried, it settled back in, but it buckled every time I put paint on it. When I would put subsequent uh, stages on it, you, it would you buckle. must have you must have soaked the masonite back. No, well, through. I must have, but not intentionally. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's a question from Candace uh, wants to know what spray do you spray on it? Um, I use an archival. I happen to use Golden's. Archival UV LS, that's ultraviolet light shield or something like that. Spray varnish because I like it the best. There are other brands as well. I've tried the Grumbacher and I didn't really care for it. It didn't seem to be as heavy of a spray. But you can get it in satin, uh, high gloss, and it's not that high of a gloss, or matte. So whichever you like. Cool. Now, would you uh, recommend it for those who uh, paint uh, detail? Yes, very much so. It just, lifting back is much easier uh, with, you know, the, the sharp edged little chisel edged brushes. Uh, you can lift back a fairly thin line. And so if you 
have a dark color and you can lift back a white, it'll be nice and crisp. Um, or you can paint on it with a very thin line either way. It's just that first coat is almost, it's, the first coat that you put on doesn't run smooth. You definitely need to wet, not soak, but wet the, the uh, clay for that first coat you put on if you want it smooth. Otherwise, it gets very hot pressy in terms of, run, you know, getting the edges and stuff. But you can smooth out those ed the blooms. Is there anything um, special? Um, everyone has their own technique for preparing a paper. Is there anything special you do to prepare your paper to paint on it? Uh, and what 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 weight do you use? Anything larger than a half sheet, I would use three hundred pound. Um, with the exception of elephant sheets, they only come in an odd size, like one fifty six. Those are ones that are 26 inches by 40 inches. I, I often paint big until now. <laughs> I don't paint that big in this RV. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't. 140 pound, I don't use. I will wet it and tape it down if I'm doing a half sheet or I have to do a full sheet. I try not to do anything big with the 140. Uh, 140, I will paint. I prefer blocks. To be quite honest, 300 pound, I don't do anything. No, no prep at all. I might staple it down here and there. I, I will use a big piece of gator board if I'm lucky to have one. Or I've used ceiling tiles. Uh, those work very well, just like gator boards. You no. just have to kind of duct tape the edge because they crumble otherwise. Um, ceiling but, tiles, like you get it... Uh... Home Depot. Huh? Yeah, Home Depot a lot of times doesn't want to sell you just one. But please don't get caught stealing from a construction site, okay? <laughs> I promise. Uh, okay. Tell us a little bit about, uh, so we talked about the preparation. Uh, what uh, paint do you use? I noticed uh, all your paintings have are very vibrant, and I think there's a theme, you use a lot of complimentary red-green combinations. Uh, so uh, tell me kind of the evolution of, uh, of that and also the uh, paint you use. I use mostly Daniel Smith in watercolors. Um, there, I use other brands as well. I'm not exclusive to it, but I like theirs the best because I tend to go to more vibrant colors. Um, I like the, the, the quinacridone colors and especially in the, the golds and the burnt oranges. I'm surprised you see a lot of red and green because I tend to use more of a purple, yellow complement, different, you know, not mute, more muted purples, but a lot of those. Well, um, I mean, you, you have a lot of complementary. Comp yeah, I know. Pretty cool. Now you, well, uh, I've never really been that successful at it, but I, I sure would like to learn how to do it like you do it. I'll mix them together. Just do In it. In spite of what they say, it doesn't always make mud. Uh -huh. Some of the most beautiful mahoganies and browns I've ever made were combinations of carbazole violet and quinacridone burnt orange or quinacridone gold. Two complementary colors. You just can't do equal amounts. But like they, to, they can make very nice colors. I like to hear from the participants. Any of you have a complementary color combination you use successfully? And, and uh, tell us maybe, is it your go-to and why is it your go-to? Because I can call on people, you know. <laughs> you can have a shy crowd. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of my favorite uh, mixes for complementary colors is when I want to mix black, I use an alizarin uh, quinacridone crimson and a thalo blue red. 
um, because the blue, they're both standing colors. They're both intense and dark. And depending upon if I want a black to lean towards the blue or the red, then I have a, a wonderful combination upon which that I add a little bit of the complementary color, which of course at purple is a yellow. And depending upon which direction I want to make, if I'm pushing it to the blue, I get a beautiful rich black. And if I push it to the red, I get a wonderful almost burnt umber. Uh, nice browns so perhaps that can help somebody out there I I did one that's close a phthalo green and quinacridone burnt orange mm -hmm. and if you mix them they're both very high chroma mm -hmm. and you can make good blacks out of them and that will either go to the browns or to the greens you can get a great mm -hmm. spruce green that way so so, uh, so in doing the blacks, uh, what, uh, what combinations are all of you using? So I heard, um, Elise, you said it was the... Uh, Quinacridone crimson. Uh-huh. And? Thalo blue red shade is my favorite for a purple combination. Thalo blue red shade. Yeah. And then I add the complement, and depending upon which direction I want to cook up my color, whether I'm going for the blacks, in which case I start with my purple that leans towards the blue, and then add the yellow to it, just a tiny minuscule amount of the complementary color. Mm -hmm. Or if I want to go to the brown family, then I push the crimson, and I'm still adding the uh, complementary color of that yellow, but because there's a dominant red to it, the neutralization process of this particular recipe uh, gives me a wonderful uh, burnt, uh, raw, burnt umber type color. And of course, if I push it to the yellow, then I'll get a, a raw umber type color. That's oh. a staining hue. Okay. Very cool. Anybody else? Uh, I've never used that. And I like the idea of being able to push it both ways. So uh, that's very cool. Uh, of course, everyone who knows Elisa knows she does a lot of cool stuff. <laughs> Thanks, Ron. <laughs> we have a very incredibly talented group of people who are all members of Florida Watercolor Society. And it's such a pleasure to be a part and to learn from everybody else like you, Terry. Yeah. Anybody have a black favorite? I have one that I use and use and use. And I don't know, it's just become a go to such that I am constantly running out of French ultramarine. I use the burnt sienda and French ultramarine, which is a pretty okay. common one. But I really need more French ultramarine right now. I am almost out. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's a pretty common one. Uh, Anyone else have there's of course any compliment you want to put on the uh, put down, but I noticed well, it's interesting are those that will uh, will put a blue, but will have various shades of that blue, not just uh, a blue. That's pretty cool. I kind of do what Linda does, but I also add uh, burnt sienna, the ultramarine. So I use the ultramarine for, to get black. Okay. Mm -hmm. I use the ultramarine and the crimson and then burnt sienna. Oh, mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, okay, so that's on the blacks. So uh, let's talk just a little bit. Does anyone have a favorite hair color? Uh, either on the um, so start, the reason I bring this up, it always comes up in a class, hair colors. And uh, some people are afraid to have, actually do hair <laughs> because they can't get the color right. You want to have a favorite on the browns or the blondes? Only and, my hairdresser knows for sure. What's that? Only my hairdresser knows the color <laughs> combination for sure. Oh, of course. You well, you asked me for hair color, so... <laughs> That's true. I, I asked. 
Anybody have a, a favorite that they've tried or have any of you have problems with it, with hair color? I work on the same principle as I do with mixing any of my blondes or my yellows and my browns, depending upon what the family of the color is, uh, will depend how I mix the base color uh, to be used for either hair or skin and what value I need for that particular individual. Oh, that's cool. I, I you know, these are, uh, these are good tips. So each week, just prepared to share a couple of years uh, along with the uh, uh, featured speaker. Uh, and uh, Terry, do you have anything you want to say before I'm going to go with, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, anyone have upcoming um, events going on in your area you want to uh, share with the group? Any, any comments, Terry? Um, I know a lot of you are limited by space, too, or have to store yourself in boxes under the bed or anything like that, right? Um, if you're lucky, when I, when I lived in the house, I had lots of room. But one thing I discovered is containerize everything put everything in some sort of container and you know they make some of these with the little flip lids on the sides you can get them uh in michael's and place like that those are all they all stack together well but um go square or go rectangular or square don't get any round containers because there's a lot of wasted storage space otherwise so that's one of my newer ones I've discovered. I like that. Um, you're always very practical. And the one thing I do like is you're always interested in saving money. And well, <laughs> I didn't realize that came across because I spend a fortune in art supplies. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'm not saying you're cheap or anything, but uh, uh, we all know how expensive these supplies can be and and don't buy cheap either so that's that's waste money yeah i think that's you're right on so frugal uh, is a better word and terry you were going to tell us the uh way that you pack your things to take out and or to store in small spaces oh well what i was going to say i've set up kits where i can take to go outside and paint and they have all these lovely plain air. I'm sorry, somebody next door is mowing the grass. They have all these wonderful plain air kit things that go in backpacks and stuff. Well, I'm almost 74 years old, and I'm not going to haul around a 50-pound backpack to go plein air painting. So I've discovered my own easy way. I have the lightweight easel, uh, the carbon fiber ones that work well. I just take the piece I told you about is a piece of aluminum about like this that has the things that hold canvases in place top and bottom and that works for blocks watercolor blocks as well in the middle of it it has a breakaway that you put on top of your tripod and then my husband was going to throw out this I don't know if you can see it it's sort of a valise like he uses a CPAP machine, and this came in it. If you can find anything like that, but everything winds up being compartmentalized. Um, this is the only round thing I have in here. The paints are, this happens to be my water-soluble oil one. Paints are in here. Uh, get those roll-up bamboo things for your brushes and put them in there couple water bottles if you could find anything like this uh, but like I said try to get it squarish there's an outside pocket that you can put your paintings in uh, whether they if and I like panels uh, whether they be paper on top of masonite or if they be uh, 
aqua board or whatever because they're lightweight. You can stack a bunch of them together. They don't take up a whole lot of room, but they're very sturdy. They don't bend. They don't get torn. They don't tear up. And these little framing devices, if they're wet, like I said, I paint in three different mediums. Uh, they're just held together with big rubber bands. These are called panelpack.com. And they're just pieces. They're, they're great little frames. I don't know if you can see this. Great little frames where the panel just sort of fits inside each side. Uh, you put put them together and hold them with two big, huge rubber bands. You can stick them in anything that way, even if the paint is wet, as long as it's not running off, you know, of course. Uh, and I've just found those to be very handy to store stuff and, and because I'm very good at paint, getting paint on everything and anything. So uh, I have the same kind of thing, the Strictly Watercolor. It's a black bag that came from Jerry's Artorama, I think, years ago that has an outside pocket like that, I can put panels or, or blocks. But I like the blocks for the 140. It just, it's just easier to handle. They provide their automatic own firm backing that can fit in uh, one of these easel with the, uh, like the canvas holders. And they'll work for everything, for canvas, for blocks of paper, for panels, anything like that. And you don't need anything special. So that's what I've been using. Very cool. And uh, I appreciate uh, you coming, Terry. Uh, the practicality and the experience is awesome. And I've learned from you and I appreciate uh, your willingness to share. Uh, in the next week, we're gonna be featuring uh, Nina Tarzer, Tarzer. And I think I spelled pronounced incorrectly. And uh, then Don Taylor is coming. So we've got some great uh, guests joining us. And then uh, uh, are the well-known and famous uh, movie actress, uh, Kathy Durden, will be joining us. Uh, so it'll start like this. We'll start with these topics. And then uh, we'll see where it goes. Everyone can ask questions, throw in your two cents. And uh, also, I'd like to hear from um, all of you uh, when you get on a little bit about uh, events that may be of interest to you. I'm going to share one real quick. Uh, uh, the upcoming uh, Florida Watercolor Society, I uh, can't help but mention that, but uh, we're almost a week away from the deadline of getting your art pieces in. So uh, be sure you get those in. It's, it is a great show. I know it's a little tough to get in, uh, but the process is well worth it. And if you get in, that's awesome. Uh, you can brag a little bit. And uh, also, uh, I think it's a, it's a really a great experience when you, once you do get in. They really uh, treat you great at the convention. Uh, speaking of the convention, it's in uh, Pointe Gorda um, Conference Center. Uh, it's next to the uh, Four Seasons Sharon, uh, Sheraton. It's a great, beautiful complex, uh, and we're going to have a trade show. I was talking today to uh, Pierre uh, Gertitti, Gert, Gert, well, anyway, not, it's a good luck. Gertitti, 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 well, anyway, if he were on, he would be laughing at me. And uh, also, uh, he's talked to and has got some commitment from uh, Cheap Joe's, so it looks like we're going to have a good trade show this year. Um, it's really looking forward to it. Does anyone else have any uh, announcements of anything coming up in our area that we should know about? Um, I don't have an announcement. Yes. But I have an a easy way to um, proportionalize uh, painting you're working on. Mm. Uh, like if you want, want to do a thumbnail sketch or something without any math involved. And it also would work for people who don't want to do math and maybe doing something that's an odd size rather than a standard size. And I'm trying to figure out how to tell it on Zoom. But if you take your uh, bottom corner, your bottom left-hand corner, 
and make a diagonal line to your um, top right hand corner and keep going. That you just reverse that to make things smaller. In other oh. words, if you want mm -hmm. something that's that's going to be twenty and three quarter inches by nine and a half inches, you <clears throat> you can make a diagonal line from the top right corner down to the bottom left corner, and then you measure however big you want your thumbnail. I don't know if that makes any sense or not, if you understand that, or if anybody yeah, does that. Yeah, yeah that, that's, that works really well. It's, it's, it's always very exactly fast. the same proportion. Yeah, it's very, very fast. I do it all the time. <laughs> that's cool. It, it, uh, Roberta, thank you for sharing that. Any closing thoughts, Terry, before we're going to play? Uh, I'm going to show the uh, um, the paintings, uh, some of your paintings, the uh, video from that uh, for the conclusion. And uh, so do you uh, have anything to say? I'm trying to think what's in it that's on aqua board. Uh, there's a still life of a Navajo wedding basket with some peppers in it on a Navajo rug with Navajo Mountain in the background. I know that was on aqua board. Um, I'm trying to think what else is in there was on aqua board. You didn't have, I, I really cannot remember right offhand without looking at them, but at least see if you can tell if that's paper or aqua board when you see it. Now just uh, speak up when you see it. Okay, let me get started. Thanks, Terry, again. Just really appreciate it. There we go. Okay, get her started. I'm going to spot you. There we go. Oh, this is fun. We should do this every Sunday. Oh, okay. We will. <laughs> 